All right. And before we even get started in looking at the Schrodinger equation and discussing what the four quantum numbers are, and we're going to get into that in quite a bit of detail tonight, I want to take a look at the periodic table and see how we divide up the periodic table in order for us to keep track of all of the electrons that are in any atom in the periodic table. So I'm going to refer back to this slide, or at least in my speech, several times this evening. It's a very, very important slide, okay? So we first of all, we divide up the periodic table into four blocks. We have the four blocks. We have the first two families, which are the alkali metals and the alkaline earths. We call this the S block. So the S block, and you have to have that memorized. The first two columns or the first two groups or the first two families, the alkali metals and the alkali earths. We call those the S block. And you can see that I have 1S and 2S and 3S and 4S. And so on. I'll get back to that a little bit more later. Now I want to move all the way over to the far right hand side of the periodic table. And you see that on the far right hand side, with the exception of this little 1S up here, and we'll talk about that later, okay? But you see that everything over here has the letter P associated with it. And you can probably guess that we call that block the P block. But over here on this side, we call that the P block. So, so far we've got the S block. And the P block, let me tidy up my letter P. There we go, the P block and the S block. Where we have the transition metals, you can see how the periodic table dips down, right? The periodic table dips down here. This is where we find the transition metals, all those favorite metals like gold and silver and iron and copper and cobalt and vanadium, you know, molybdenum, tungsten, osmium, whatever. There's a lot of transition metals. In fact, most of the elements in the periodic table are metals. But that block, we call that the D block the D block. And then finally, at the bottom, we have the lanthanides and actinides. And we call the lanthanides and actinides, we call that the F block. So the F, F block. And you might be wondering, you know, what's the significance of this letter S and the letter P, the letter D, and the letter F? Well, as, as the lecture moves on, we're going to talk about that more and more, what these letters actually represent. But first thing you need to know is how we divide up the periodic table into four blocks, okay? So we have four, four blocks, and they are S, P, D, and F. And you're gonna wanna have them memorized in that specific order. They go from S to P to D to F. And the reason why you have to memorize them in that order, which is not alphabetical, there's historical significance to it, but the reason why you wanna memorize them in that order it's because they kind of increase in energy. As you go from an S to a P to a D to an F, the, um, we, we get an increase in energy. And I'll talk again more about what these things mean as we move on. Okay? So we've got that so far. The S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. In fact, I remember learning this in high school chemistry. You know, it's one of the few things I remember my uh, teacher, you know, explaining to us. The S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. I want to point out a couple more things to you, right? We've talked about the horizontal rows on the periodic table are called periods. Well, you probably noticed that, you know, we have the first period, then we get the second period, third, fourth, fifth, sixth, and seventh. If you look at the numbers for the periods on the periodic table, you see that the S and the P block, you see how they line up perfectly? For example, if I have, if I'm on the second period, you see I have a 2S and then I have a 2P. They call those a 2S and a 2P. Okay, say for example, I'm looking at, you know, the fifth period. I've got 5S and 5P. But you probably notice where I'm going with this is that there's something that's a little stranger. In fact, a couple of things that are a little strange. Okay, when we go from a 4S, we don't go to a 4D. It dips down one. Okay, so you actually subtract one when you get to the D orbital. So it's kind of like you take, if you were to call this number N, right? If you were to say N is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7 for the, um, the periods, You'd say here it's kind of like n minus 1, right? Here it's n minus 1. Here it's n minus 1. Here it's n minus 1, right? Because n minus 1 here would be 4 minus 1, which gives you a 3. Here n minus 1 would be four, uh, 5 minus 1, which gives you 4, so on and so forth. So it's kind of like that. I'm going to erase that because I just want to help guide you through it. I don't want to leave that ugliness on there. And then you probably notice that when you get to the lanthanides and the actinides, those would actually be inserted where? They would actually be inserted right here. Okay, so you see that with the lanthanides and actinides, we don't go from a six to a, to a six. We go from a six all the way to a four, right? 
And so here it's kind of like n minus 2, and here it's like n minus 2 because we go from a 7 to a 5, okay? Now you're like, okay, Mr. Dean, all you're doing is throwing weird numbers and letters at me, and, you know, I'm not really even understand what you're getting at yet. Well, the way electron configuration works in my mind is that you it's more helpful to be in, introduced to this concept first because then when we start to look at quantum numbers or the way that we sort of characterize electrons in an atom, it makes a lot more sense if you see this first, okay? And if you've looked through the slide deck already, you probably noticed that this is actually one of the last slides we're going to look at tonight as well. Okay, and so this slide is going to come up several times throughout the lecture. I'll be skipping around and referring to it, all right? Okay, well, again, hopefully you watch the first four videos that cover all the first concepts in the book. Um, it goes all the way up to the Heisenberg uncertainty principle. It talks about the nature of light and the hydrogen atom, the Bohr atom, and we talk about you know speed of light, electromagnetic radiation, and all those good things. And where we're at now is talking about the electron and the Schrodinger equation. Because if you remember that Bohr's theory for the hydrogen atom only worked for the hydrogen atom, we said that the um, electrons in the hydrogen atom were in orbits. Well, again, the Bohr model only works for the hydrogen atom. What if we have an atom that has one more than one electron? And if you're thinking, well, that's isn't that most atoms, Mr. Dean? Yeah, absolutely. And so going back to the nature of light earlier on in this series of videos, I think it was probably in section 7.1 or 7.2, where it was determined that light has not only a wave property, but it also has a particle property. And that was discovered by Albert Einstein when he uncovered the photoelectric effect. And then later on, scientists said, well, if a light wave can have both, or sorry, if light can have both a wave and a particle property, well, maybe an electron that is a particle has a mass, maybe that can have a wave property, okay? And so in 1926, Erwin Schrödinger wrote an equation that described both the particle and the wave nature of an electron. And you see that equation shown up here. Now, in order to you know, understand this equation fully and use this equation and to manipulate it, you have to have advanced calculus in order to do that. So we're not gonna be doing that in this class, but you see this variable in here, right? You see this Greek letter in here. And that Greek letter, and I'm gonna try my best to write it up, that's called psi, okay? And we call that the wave function. And if you solve for that psi, the wave function describes the energy of an electron with a given wave function. And it also describes the probability of finding an electron in a volume of space. Now, again, Schrodinger's equation is much like the Bohr atom in that it can only be solved exactly for the hydrogen atom, but it is a very good approximation for multi electron systems. Now, what is that wave equation made of? Now, again, we're not going to use advanced calculus to solve for the wave equation, but the wave equation is made up of four numbers called quantum numbers. And the four numbers, four quantum numbers are N, L, ML, and MS. And we're going to discuss each one of these letters in detail, or sort of each one of these, well, these letters, which are called quantum numbers. Um, but we're going to discuss each one of these in detail. And we're going to start with number one. Okay, so yeah, we're going to start with n, the principal quantum number. And the values of n can simply be an integer that's not, and we, and we can't have a zero. So we start with number one, and we increase from one to two to three to four to five to six to seven. Okay, what does that n mean? Okay, that n describes the distance an electron is from a nucleus. Remember, the wave function, okay, is a function of four numbers called quantum numbers. You know, what is the whole point behind what I'm talking about right now, okay? What we're gonna be able to do is we are going to give four quantum numbers for every single electron in an atom. That's our goal tonight, that's, a, that's our first goal, okay? And if you're like uh, kind of unsure about what I'm talking about, let me explain it to you maybe a couple of different ways, okay? Let's say we have an atom like aluminum. Okay, how many electrons are in aluminum? Aluminum is element number 13 in the periodic table. So 
aluminum has 13 electrons. We are going to be able to come up with a set of quantum numbers for each one of those 13 electrons. Okay. Let me give you an example that's even simpler. Okay. An element that has less electrons. Let me pick something simpler. Um, why don't we pick beryllium? Okay. Beryllium has a total of four electrons. Okay. So it's got the first electron, then it's got the second electron, then it's got the third electron, then it's got the four, fourth electron. What we are going to be able to do by the end of this lecture is for the first electron, we're going to be able to give it a set of quantum numbers, N, L, ML, and MS. The second electron, we're going to be able to give it a set of quantum numbers, N, L, ML, and MS. The third one, we're going to be able to give it a set of quantum numbers, N, L, M, L, and M, S. And you're like, oh, Mr. Dion, you're boring me. N, L, M, L, and M, S. Okay. You're like, why would I want to do that? You know, why would I want to give a descriptor to every single electron in an atom? Well, um, what we're doing when we, when we provide a set of four quantum numbers for every electron in an atom, we describe the energy of that electron, and we also describe the probability of finding it in a volume of space. Another way of thinking about these quantum numbers that we're going to learn about this evening is say you go to a baseball game, right, or a football game, and you're at, you know, Coors Field or something like that. They give you a ticket stub, right? What does the ticket stub say on it? You know, it's got your seat, or sorry, it's got your, I don't know, section maybe. It's got your section on it. Then it has the row you know, whatever, and then it has seats, so on and so forth. So it's going to have all these different, you know, numbers on there. But remember, each one of the seats in that stadium has a unique section row or section row and seat and whatever. OK, and that's exactly what we're doing to these elect to the electrons. OK, so let's talk a little bit more about the four quantum numbers, N, L, M, L, and M, S. Again, I told you that the principal quantum number, N, and you have to have that memorized, N is called the principal quantum number. I'm going to say that a lot this evening. N can be equal to one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. Okay. Hey, let's back up a little bit. I'm doing it already. Did you notice that I kind of referred to that here? I said N can be equal to, you know, one, two, three, four, so on and so forth. All right. And I'm not going to make the connection yet, but I will as the lecture proceeds. Okay. So what does that N mean to us right now? N is the distance that the electron is from the nucleus, and it also describes the energy of an orbital. What does that mean? If we go from uh, an S orbital, and the shape of an S orbital is simply a sphere, so an S orbital orbital is a sphere. It's got a spherical shape. Okay, so can you draw a sphere? I don't know. There's my best try. Okay, so this is an S orbital like that. You can see here that we've got three different S orbitals. We've got one that we call a 1s. The reason we call it a 1s is because the principal quantum number of that s orbital is 1. And you can see that it's smaller than the other two s orbitals, which are a 2s and a 3s. So what's the significance of going from this 1s to this 2s to this 3s? The energy of the orbital is increasing, right? As the, as the n gets bigger, energy is increasing. So we can put here higher higher energy, lower, lower energy. Okay, so energy is increasing. But what's more obvious? What's more obvious is that it's getting bigger. And if the principal quantum number is getting bigger, the size of the orbital is getting bigger, that means that the electron can be farther from the nucleus, or the electron, I should say, is farther from the nucleus. Okay, as the electron gets farther away from the nucleus, it gets higher in energy. So again, the principal quantum number, N, and, you know, we're going to look at a lot of ends this evening, right? It describes what? It describes the distance from the nucleus and the energy of an orbital. So the bigger the principal quantum number, the farther from the nucleus and the higher energy of the orbital. Let me ask you a question, and this is not a joke. Okay, I'm sure you're going to be like, okay, come on, Mr. Dion. Give me, give me a challenge. Look, if I was comparing a 2S and a, I don't know, in a 6S orbital, which one of these would be higher in energy, a 2s or a 6s? It's not a trick. Like, Mr. Dion, come on, isn't this a university or isn't this college? You know, university level. Yeah, 
Thanks, Julius. You know, it wasn't meant to be a, a complicated question. It was meant to be a question that all of you would just nail right away. Because you're saying, come on, man. You just told me the principal quantum number uh, is it increases. The size of the orbital should be bigger for a 6s compared to, to a 2s. You know, that's my attempt at drawing the two of them like that. And you also know that not only is a 6s bigger than a 2s, it's also higher in energy. So there we go. We've already defined one of the quantum numbers, the principal quantum numbers. And they're always listed in this order, N, L, M, L, and MS. So now what have you learned so far? You've learned that for every electron in an atom, you can provide a set of four quantum numbers. And so far we've covered the first one, N, which is the principal quantum number. It's the first of the four quantum numbers. Somebody's walking down the street and says, what does N stand for? You say principal quantum number, the possible value. Could it be a value of zero? No, it has to start on one, has to be an integer, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. All right, a little bit more information um, uh, is shown here. Uh, this is just to kind of help, you know, kind of guide me as I'm talking with you guys to make sure I don't leave any anything out here. The, the three quantum numbers. So if we look at those quantum numbers, again, if we have our N, our L, our ML, and our MS. Just this is just one more kind of point I wanted to make to you before I keep, you know, just start cruising along here. Is that there's kind of a different difference between the first three quantum numbers and the last quantum number. Okay. The first three quantum numbers, it says three quantum numbers. The first three, N, L, and ML, are used to describe the distribution of electrons in hydrogen and other atoms. The fourth quantum number um, doesn't describe the distribution of the electrons. It describes a different um, behavior, okay? And I'm going to talk about what that is as we move along. In fact, obviously, it's the last one that we're going to look at, okay? But it, MS will not describe the distribution. It describes, I'll tell you right now, it describes what's called electron spin, okay? And no, electrons don't spin like a top, but... Uh, Anyhow, that, that is what it describes. And you can think, you can totally think of an electron as spinning like a top. Anyhow, and we'll talk about that more later. Okay. And you might be thinking, you know, Mr. Dion, it's taking you a while to get started here. You know, you're going kind of slow. Well, I think in quantum numbers, it's always better to start slow than kind of kick it up a notch. Okay, so we've covered what? We've covered N. That is the principal, principal quantum, quantum, number that's what we've done so far now we're going to talk about l okay that's what this whole slide is about l is called the angular momentum quantum number i don't know the easiest way to memorize this but i find the angular okay the letter l i don't know something like that okay so for any given value of n what were the possible values of that of n right we said that n could be equal to one two or so on and so forth. Okay, here's how you decide what the values of L are. L always starts on zero, no exception. Okay, but L can be equal to zero, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, all the way up to n minus one. Okay, that's the rule. Let's look at some examples. Okay, if I have an n equal to one, the only possible value for L would be zero, right? Why? Because n is equal to, maybe I'll write it up here, n is equal to 1, 2, 3, 4, l is equal to 0, 1, 2, you know, all the way up to n minus 1. Okay, so this is what we've got so far. Okay, these two rules right here. Okay, so if n is equal to 1, l can be equal to 0. If n is equal to 2, right, if n is equal to 2, then l could be 0 or 1. If n is equal to 3, l could be 0, 1, or 2. Hey, let me ask you guys a question. If n was equal to four, what would my possible values of L be? And it's not a trick question. Right, it would be zero, one, two, and three. Remember, you're all right. It always starts on zero. So if if I had n is equal to four, it would be zero, one, two. Let me write it the way they have it here, or three. Okay. Now you might be wondering, you know, hey, Mr. Dion, what's the significance of this of this L business? Well, here it is down here. 
L describes L describes the shape of the volume of space that the electron occupies. Okay, so L is nothing more than the shape of an orbital. Okay, now what did we say so far? The shape of an s orbital. An s orbital is a sphere, like this. A p orbital. I mean, you'll usually hear instructors call it um, a dumbbell. They say it looks like a dumbbell. Well, to me, if I draw a dumbbell, you know, if I was going to hit the gym, it would look something like that, okay? But when we say a p orbital looks like a dumbbell, here's what it actually looks like. It looks like this. It's got two lobes like this, okay? I've heard students say all kinds of funny things. Somebody said p for propeller. Somebody else said p for peanut, which I thought was actually kind of funny. I didn't hear that one until this semester. The P for peanut. Okay, so again, the L just describes the shape. All right. Okay. So we got an S orbital is a sphere. We got a P orbital that's a peanut or a propeller. The D orbital, you're like, hey, Mr. Deal, what's the shape of a D? You know what? I'm not going to draw it. Okay. The D orbitals, well, I could try my best. Okay, a D orbital. There's there's five different types of D orbital. Sorry, but one of them kind of looks like a four leaf clover. Okay, like that. You know, what? I'm going to erase this. Anyhow, let me, uh, I think I have them on a slide in a little bit. Here are the shapes of the orbitals, but before we get there, I want to talk about one more quantum number. Okay, we've covered, you know what, let me paste from here. Let me, um, let me take this stuff right here. I'm going to copy this. I'm going to paste it over here just to kind of keep it in the back of our mind. While we're going through these here quantum numbers, so far, we've covered N, principal quantum number. We've covered L, angular momentum quantum number. What did N stand for? It's good for um, the size of the orbital, right? And the energy of the orbital as N increased. The, the orbital got bigger and its energy increased. What does L stand for? L stands for the shape of the orbital. You know what? I forgot to say something, didn't I? I left something out over here, something very important. So when L is equal to zero, Okay, this is what I forgot to say. I'm getting overly excited with this. Anyhow, when L is equal to zero, that describes an S orbital. When L is equal to one, that describes a P orbital. When L is equal to two, that describes a D orbital. When L is equal to three, that describes an F orbital. Now, where did you see these things earlier this evening, right? Remember the first thing I told you this evening was the S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block. Okay? And so what you're going to see is the shape of the orbitals in the S block are going to be spheres. The shape of the orbitals in the P block are going to be these, these peanuts or propellers or dumbbells, whatever you want to call it. The shape of the D orbitals and F orbitals, I will never ask you to draw a D orbital or an F, F orbital. Hear ye, hear ye. You can take that to the bank, okay? You can throw that in my face, okay? If I ever say, you know, hey, you, draw, draw me a D orbital. I'm never going <coughs> to, excuse me. <coughs> I'm never going to ask you to do it. What I would ask you to do with D orbitals, and we're going to look at them in a second, is to be able to recognize. Recognize it if you see it, right? You see a D orbital in the book, you should know what it looks like, but I'll never ask you to reproduce it, okay? So let's put that down here. When L is equal to zero, that's an S orbital. When L is equal to one, that's a P orbital, D orbital, and when three, if L is equal to three, that would be an F orbital, so on and so forth. All right, so now we're cooking with gas. Let's go back here, when L, When my L is equal to zero, that's an let me yeah, it's an S orbital. That's an S. When L is equal to one, that's a P. When L is equal to two, that's a D orbital. And when L is equal to three, that's an F orbital. Let's talk about the third quantum number. Okay, now we've made it to the third quantum number because we've already discussed N and L. So now we're on to ML. ML stands for magnetic quantum number. The way I've memorized that one is, you know, M magnetic, okay? So the magnetic quantum number. The first thing is that what are the possible values of ML, okay? If we have a given value of L and we've already be equal to, the values of ML can be negative L all the way up to zero and then all the way up to positive L. They have to be integers. Let me give you two examples. They're shown right here. If L is equal to 1, which we said is a p orbital, what are the possible values of ML? Based on this formula, the ML 
ML is is equal to zero. All crazy mess to do it. At minus L all the way up to zero, all the way up to positive L like that. Okay. If my L is equal to one, what's the negative of one? Negative one. Then from negative one, I go to zero, and then I go up to positive one like that. Let's try one to get uh, a few more numbers. What if I had L is equal to two? Okay, what would my possible numbers of ML be? Negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, and positive two. Let's try another one. If L, if L was equal to three, which represents an F orbital, orbital, like that. What are my possible values of ML? They're gonna be negative three, negative two, Negative one, zero, positive one, positive two, and positive three, like that. Okay. Are you with me so far? Give me a thumbs up if you follow me so far. I'm trying not to go too fast. A lot of information here. I, I completely understand that. Okay, cool. Great. Awesome. Well, if you want to know what the magnetic quantum number represents, it's the orientation of an orbital in space. Okay. You know, there's one other L that we neglected here. Let's think about it for a second. And that L is what about if L is equal to zero? Okay. If L is equal to zero, that's an S orbital. Orbital. What would the values of ML be when my L is equal to zero? Who could tell me? It's not a trick question. It's not a long answer either. Exactly. Trevor, you nailed it, right? If it can be negative L, there's no such thing as negative zero. There's no such thing as positive zero. It could just be zero, right? It could just be zero. So I want you to focus on this just for a second. Just this specific case. If L is equal to zero, which means it's an S orbital, we said that an S orbital was a sphere, okay? It's a sphere like that. If ML is zero, that means there's only one value of ML or my L is equal to zero. And if ML represents the orientation orbital in space, that makes sense because how many ways could I point a sphere? There's no way to, there's only one way to point a sphere. If I'm holding a football, you could, you could say, hey, could you point the football at me, right? But if I'm holding a basketball, you're like, hey, turn the basketball around, point it at me. No, it doesn't matter how you grab the basketball, it's a sphere. It's always pointing at you. Okay, so it makes sense that the S orbital could all, is only pointing in one direction. Let me help you. This is, I'm just kind of getting ahead a little bit here, but I think it's very helpful. What if you had a P orbital? We said the P looks like a propeller or a peanut, okay? We said the P. It looks something like this, or p orbital. Well, the possible values of ml are zero, sorry, negative one, zero, and positive one. Again, ml represents the orientation of the orbital in space. That tells me that there's three possible ways that I could orient the p orbital. Let me tell you what they are. If you've studied algebra, uh, or if you studied math, you know, at any kind of like high school level, you've probably learned how to make a 3D graph. We know that there's an x-axis, a y-axis, and you probably also know that there's a z-axis, okay? Like this, here's the, the z-axis story we're in America. Right? You have the z-axis going like this, the x-axis going like this, and then we have the y-axis going like this. And so the three possible orientations for a p-orbital are, it could be on the x-axis like this, it can be on the y-axis, like that, or it could be on the z axis. Now, I put all of them there together, I'll just knock it off like that. But well, we have names for those. We call them the px, the py, and the pz, like that. Okay, I've given you enough information there that I think you're old enough to, to see this orbital shape and quantum numbers, right? We talked about n can be equal to one, two, three, so on and so forth. We said that L is equal to zero, one, two, all the way up to N minus one. We said that ML could be equal to negative L all the way up to zero, all the way up to positive L, okay? And we said that an S orbital is a sphere. I don't even have to draw it right here. 
Okay. We said that a P orbital looks like a peanut, and then you see the D orbitals have all these kind of interesting shapes that we'll look at in a second. Okay. So here are my S orbitals. All right. When my N is equal to one, you can see the sphere is like this. When it's two, it's bigger. When it's three, it's bigger. Okay. Now here they've shown the N increasing going from one to two to three, like that. With the P orbitals, they're not showing that. Look. All of these p orbitals have an n is equal to 2, and that's why they all have the same size. When n is equal to 2, they're showing you here <clears throat> an L equal to 1. <clears throat> because we know that when L is equal to 1, that's a p orbital, right? But they're showing you the three possible values of ML, minus 1, 0, and positive 1. And as I told you, that represents the three possible orientations of those p orbitals, okay? We can have the px, so this would represent the px. You see how it's on the x-axis. This would represent the py. You can see how it's on the y-axis. And finally, we have the pz, which you can see is on the, the <clears throat> z-axis. The d orbitals, there's five of them, right? It makes sense because when I have d, that's when my l is equal to 2. My possible values are of ml are minus 2, minus 1, 0, plus 1, and plus 2. Well, it means that I can have five different orientations of these orbitals. And again, I'm not going to ask you to draw these. You see that one of them here is really strange. You know, it's kind of got like the donut with something with a P orbital shoved in it like that. Um, I'd say that sort of the shapes of these orbitals are kind of beyond the scope of our class, at least discussing, you know, how they're formed or whatever. But what I would expect you to do is to be able to rep to um, recognize the, these orbitals if you see them. Okay. So what have we talked about this evening, you know, so far? All we've really talked about are the first three quantum numbers, right? M, L, M, L. We haven't talked about M, S yet. We're not there, but we have covered M, L, and M, L. Principal quantum number, N. Angular momentum quantum number, <clears throat> L, <clears throat> which represents the shape of the volume of the orbital. And M, L, which represents the orientation of the orbital in space. Okay, give me a thumbs up if you follow me thus far. I'll take a drink of coffee while you're doing that. If there's a question, feel free to, to ask me in the chat. I'm all ears. But there's no need to make this topic more complicated than it is. We're just going to get to the bottom of it. Make sure that you have the tools to answer any question that you would have to. Okay, so what does an F orbital look like, Julius? There you go. That's what the F orbitals look like. Happy? Okay. I'm never going to ask you to draw an F orbital. You can see that there's seven types of F orbitals. All right. Because when we have an F orbital, what is our L? Our L is three, and the possible values of ML are minus two, minus one, minus, <laughs> minus three. No, sorry. Minus two, minus one. Sorry. What am I doing wrong here? This would be on his tired. So if I have. Yeah. Right, so. When I have an F orbital, my L is equal to three and my possible values count with me, okay? They would be what? Minus three, that's one. Minus two, that's two. Minus one, that's three. Zero, that's four. Plus one, that's five. Plus two, that's six. And then plus three, and that's seven. So we have a total of seven F orbitals. Cool? Okay. All right, there we go. Are you happy, Julius? I asked you if you were happy. You didn't answer me. There we go. There we go. So those are what the F orbitals look like. Um, so now let's discuss the last quantum number, the MS, right? We haven't talked about MS. Now, if we back up a little bit, let's back up. We got that. We back up all the way up here. Okay, this will help you understand, you know, what we're getting at. The first three quantum numbers, NL and ML, are required to describe the distribution of electrons. Okay. 
Whereas the fourth quantum number, that was what we're going to talk about now, MS describes the behavior of a electron and completes the description. Okay, so MS is a little bit different. A little bit different. And if you take a beam of electrons and you fire them um, at a screen, okay, and that's kind of a very simple way of describing this experiment that you see down here at the bottom. Okay, if you put those that beam of um, atoms with electrons in them, of course, um, through a magnet, what you're going to see is that some of them are deflected towards the magnet and some of them are deflected away from the magnet. And the reason why that some of them are attracted to the magnet and some of them are repelled by the magnet is because they have kind of opposite um, the magnetic field is oriented in opposite directions, okay? Because what happens is if you have a moving charged body, it will always create a little magnetic field. So the way that you can think about an electron, okay, it's kind of like a bun, right? Because it has a negative charge. So if the charge is spinning in one direction, it's like the magnet is aligned in one direction. And if the charge is spinning in the opposite direction, it's like the magnet is pointed in the opposite direction. So you're going to have half of them spinning in one direction and half of them spinning in the opposite direction. And so they have opposite ends of the magnetic poles. And so some of them are going to, or half of them are going to be attracted to the magnet and half of them are going to be repelled. Now, how do we describe that? Do we call them one and two, A and B, X and Y? What do we do? We call them plus a half and minus a half. Those are the numbers that we give to what we call the spin states. So MS stands for spin quantum number, okay? Or sometimes I'll call it electron spin maybe. Uh, usually I'll call it spin quantum number. And the only possible values for MS are plus a half and minus a half. Only possible um, numbers, plus a half and minus a half. So basically you have two possibilities. The electron can be spinning in one of two directions, plus a half or minus a half. And it's like the poles of a magnet, whether it's aligned, you know, with the north facing the top or the south facing the top. So these two electrons, we say they have opposite spins. Okay. Now, let me add something to this MS that I don't think is on here. No, let me show you a couple other things. You see every single one of these orbitals on here. Okay. Let me write this down here. MS, MS can be equal to plus a half or minus a half okay i want you to listen to me very carefully here okay if you're like kind of dozing off or looking at something else on the internet right now just pay attention to me for a second every single one of these orbitals that's on here see i'm circling a lot for emphasis every single one of those orbitals can hold a maximum of two electrons okay look this orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons this orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons this one can hold a maximum of two electrons. They can all hold a maximum of two electrons. Every orbital, all the F orbitals, they can all hold a maximum of two electrons. But whenever you have two electrons in an orbital, they have to have opposite spins. You can never have two electrons with the same spin in an orbital. And so now we kind of come to the end of quantum numbers, right? We've defined the four quantum numbers N. Principal quantum number, L, angular momentum quantum number, ML, magnetic quantum number, and MS, spin quantum number. Existence and energy of an electron in an, of an electron in an atom is described by its unique wave function, right? What do the quantum numbers describe? They describe the electrons okay, in an atom because the wave function requires advanced calculus to solve. Now, what I was referring to when I said that you can't have two, um, two electrons in an orbital with the same spin, okay? when I told you that you can have two electrons in an orbital, but they've got to have opposite spin, that is called the Pauli exclusion principle. Okay, You need to know it. You need to know what Pauli exclusion principle means. No two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers. And if you're thinking, Mr. Dion, that's not what you said. You said that in an orbital, um, the two electrons have to have opposite spins. That's the, that's the exact same thing, okay? It might not seem like it, but in fact, when I said that, that's the exact same thing, okay? 
because when we list our four quantum numbers, okay, we can have identical n's, identical l's, and identical ml's. What do those describe? They describe an orbital. I told you that every orbital can hold a maximum of two electrons and they must have different spins, plus a half or minus a half. So you can see how this now means the same thing. No two electrons in an atom can have the same four quantum numbers because if I have an orbital and it can hold a maximum of two electrons, one of these is going to have to be plus a half and the other one would have to be minus a half. Okay, and if you're still like, I'm not 100% sure about what you're saying with this whole, you know, poly exclusion principle, we're going to cover it in even more detail here. If, again, here's that example of being in a force field, or I don't know where this is, okay, each seat has a unique identifier. No seat can hold, sorry, each seat can hold only one individual at a time. Now, seats in a stadium can hold only one person at a time, whereas the orbitals can hold a maximum of two electrons, okay? All right, well, with all that in mind, let's talk about some vernacular that's going to come up now and again in the textbook and in my in my talking, you know, with you guys about the subject, the quantum numbers, NL, ML, and MS. A little bit more, when I talk about shell, if I say these two electrons are in the same shell, that means that they have the same principal quantum number. Okay, so you need to know what shell means, and you know what? The more you practice, the easier it gets. When I say two electrons are in the same subshell, that's when they have the same values of N and L. Okay, just to rehash, what were the possible values of L? Okay, when L, oops, let me put here. Let's make a little let's make a little chart. Okay, if we have L and we have orbital, orbital. L is equal to zero, one, two, or three. When L is equal to zero, it's an S orbital. When L is equal to one, it's a P orbital. When L is equal to two, that's a D orbital. And when L is equal to three, that's an F orbital. You've got to have that memorized, okay? So let's say I was talking about, um, you know, uh, I had a principal quantum number of, let's say, a, uh, three, and then I have an L of P, okay? An L of one, so I have P. So let's say I'm talking about a three P orbital. Well, um, I would call that a subshell, let's say the 3P subshell, okay? And nothing more than that. It's, it's just, you know, kind of vernacular in the way we use to describe things, right? Learning anything new is always like learning a language, right? And you have to learn some of the, the tricks and the, the ways we describe things. Next, orbital, electrons with the same values of N, L, and ML, okay? So let's go back to that 3P example for orbital. Let's say I had, you know, um, an L is, or sorry, N is equal to three, my L is equal to one, and my ML is equal to, you know, minus one like that, okay? Well, that would mean that it's a 3P. And what were the three possibilities for a 3P? I could have a 3PX, a 3PY, or a 3PZ. So we'll call this maybe a 3PX, okay? So that's what an orbital means. All right, there we go. Well, let's try some practice problems, okay? If you're confused even a little bit, which is not uncommon when you're first learning electron configuration, um, probably the easiest way to understand what the hell is going on, pardon my language, is to try some practice problems, okay? And I'll help you walk through all of these tonight, do them as a group, kind of make it nice and easy and see if we can just rationalize what the answers would be and hopefully they're gonna make sense to us. Okay, here's the first question. What are the allowed values of ML, okay, the magnetic quantum number, when we have a principal quantum number N is equal to four and an angular momentum quantum number L is equal to one? Let's write down, like, what do we know, okay? We know that our N is equal to four and we know that our L is equal to one. What do we know about L? I'm going to write it out again here, L and orbital. Okay, we said that when L is equal to zero, that's an S. When it's one, it's a P. When it's two, it's a D. And when it's three, it's an F. So that means we've got a four T orbital. Okay, we've got some kind of four. From this, we know we have a four P orbital. Well, that's not what the question is. The question is asking, what are the allowed values of ML? Well, we know from the rules that we looked at before, that L can be equal to, Negative L, 
all the way up to zero, all the way up to positive L, like that. So that means if our M, sorry, if our L is equal to one, our ML can be one. Who can answer it for me? I bet you somebody out there can just nail it. Nailed it. Yeah, thanks, Trevor. Trevor, you're 100% correct. He said, look, based off of what we've learned, ML. Sorry, did I write L when I meant to write ML keepers? Okay, so ML is supposed to be equal to negative L all the way up to zero to positive L. Sorry about that. Okay, um, my ML values, if my L is equal to one, can be what? Negative one zero and positive one so this is the answer to the question right here give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that sorry i made a mistake there i don't know what i meant to write ml but anywho okay good all right where are we boom good enough there we go first problem down the hatch and if you're wondering, you know, hey, is that the kind of question you could ask on an exam? Absolutely. Perfectly reasonable question. Good question for a final exam. Now, this table here comes directly straight out of our textbook, shows the relationship between quantum numbers and atomic orbitals. So here's the N values. We've got one, two, three, four, so on and so forth, right? Because we've already said that N can be equal to one, two, three, so on and so forth. L can be equal to zero, one, two, three, all the way up to N minus one. ML, I won't make that mistake again, is equal to negative L all the way up to zero, all the way up to positive L. And then MS, MS can be equal to plus a half and minus a half. Okay, well, if we look at these, okay, let's start at the top. We've got N is equal to one, okay? The only possible value for L here is zero. And if L is equal to zero, we already looked at it. I already asked you about this. You said there's only one possible type of ML, which is zero. So that makes sense because the sphere can only point in one direction, right? The same direction. Okay, so that means we've got a 1s orbital. All right, that covers 1s. If we move up to n is equal to 2. What are the two possible values that we have for L? L could be zero and it could be one. When L is equal to zero, the only possible value for ML is zero. And so there's only one type of ML orbital, right? Because ML represents number of orbitals. Okay, so there's only one type of 2s orbital. But when I have three mLs here, that means that this is a 2p. There's three types of 2p orbitals, right? I told you there's the px, the py, and the pz, or pz, as you call it down here in the States, okay? So there we go. Let's pick something even more involved, okay? Let's scooch all the way down to the, to the uh, 3d, okay? If we have an n of three, and l can be zero, one, and two, if we have an l of two, what are the possible values of ML? Negative two, negative one, zero, positive one, and positive two. How many orbitals? Five. Here are all the names of them. You want to have your mind blown? Okay. Look at this. Look at the number of possible orbitals. Okay. For an S, there's only one type of orbital, right? For a P, there's three possible types of orbitals. For a D, there's five possible types of orbitals. Okay. You follow, give me a thumbs up if you just follow me on that. For an S, there's one. For a P, there's three. And for a D, there's five. And this is just based off of these learning this evening for quantum numbers. The point I want to make to you is that this is it's, it is sensible. Just give me a thumbs up if you follow me on that. An S, there's only one type of S orbital. For a P, there's three types of orbitals. Cha, okay, good. Thanks, Chris. And for a D, there's five types of orbitals. Watch this back all the way up to the very beginning of the class. Okay, now you're going to have to kind of bear with me here a little bit because I'm going to try to draw some vertical lines, but you know 
that we have two groups here, and that in the P block, it goes from, say, boron to carbon, carbon to nitrogen to oxygen to fluorine to neon. So I'm going to try to divide this up the best way I can. Okay, like this. I told you earlier on tonight that every orbital can hold two electrons. And how do you see why they call it the S block, the P block, the D block, and the F block? Because there's only one type of S orbital, isn't there? Right? There's only one type. If every orbital can hold two electrons, look, one, two, one, two, okay, for my S. If P, if there's three types of P orbitals, there's PX, PY, and PZ, that's three types of orbitals. What's three times two? Six. Look at this. One, two, three, four, five, six. What about the D orbital? Right? You don't even have to have all the names memorized. I never asked you to memorize them, but I told you that there's five types of orbitals. Okay? If you divide up the transition metals, you'll see that there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Right? There's ten columns there. Ah, now it's all starting to come together. If you go to the F orbitals, there's seven types of F orbitals, right? Minus three, minus two, minus one, zero, plus one, plus two, and plus three. That equals seven total orbitals. What's seven times two? Because every orbital can hold two electrons, 14. I dare you to count across the lanthanides or actinides. You're going to see that you have 14 going across from here to here. Give me a thumbs up if you think that's cool. And maybe you think it's totally boring, but either way, you have to know it, okay? And see, now you start, what I wanted to get to before we took a break is the connection between the quantum numbers and the periodic table, because there's totally a connection there. In fact, we're going to be using the periodic table to help us, you know, assign a set of quantum numbers to um, all the, so to each electron in an atom, okay? Kind of neat, huh? All right. Well, let's uh, keep moving here. Where was I? This is a figure from our textbook, which is a plot of electron density in a hydrogen. 1s orbital is a function of the distance from the nucleus, right? Because we know that hydrogen is in period one, right? So for hydrogen, ah, where's my pen? For hydrogen, it's n is equal to one. It's only got one measly electron. Um, the electron density that you can see, it falls off rapidly. The electron density is represented by the green color, and it falls off rapidly from the nucleus increases. Now, over here, this black line here, that's a boundary surface diagram of the 1s orbital. And over here, this is a more realistic way of viewing electron density distribution, and that's to divide the 1s orbital into successive spherical thin shells. If we do a plot of this, okay, if we plot this, if we do a plot of the probability of finding the electron in each of those shells on the bottom left here, we call that a radial probability as a function of distance. It shows a maximum, if you were to plot this maximum distance here, it's 52.9 picometers. And that's equal to the radius of the innermost orbit in the Bohr model. And so when we're talking about orbitals, if you're like, what's the whole point of this slide here, Mr. Dion? Okay, it's a hydrogen atom, and I see that as I get farther and farther away from the tiny little black dot, which is the nucleus, that there's less and less probability that I'm going to find um, the electron. Well, technically speaking, the electron can be anywhere outside of the nucleus, right? It can be all the way to, the, to another solar system, okay? And if you're thinking, well, that's kind of crazy, probably not going to be there. You're right, okay? I said it's a probability, but what we define as the boundary orbital, because we talked about, right, we said, okay, well, if you have a 1s, you know, where's my pen? You have a 1s, for example, it's this size, and you get a 2s, it's bigger, and then a 3s, so on and so forth. 
wh where do you get off giving this size here? Well, that size and those shapes of the orbitals that we look at, that is where you have a 90% probability of finding the electron. Okay, now this slide just shows you specifically for the hydrogen atom for a 1s orbital, but it could be for a 2s, for a 3s, could be for a 3p, could be for a 4d. The boundary of that shape of those orbitals that we looked at, even those f orbitals, those wacky f orbitals that we looked at tonight, the boundary of those orbitals shows you where 90%, where the electron is 90% of the time. Okay? So that's where we get the shape and the boundaries for our orbitals. Okay? Again, this is just showing you things that I've already showed you tonight. Okay? When L is equal to zero, right? Because if we have an L in our orbital over here, when L is equal to zero, we have an S orbital. When L is equal to, yeah, I'm getting excited here. That's a p orbital. When l is equal to two, that's a d orbital. And when l is equal to three, that's an f orbital. Okay. Well, if my l is equal to zero, I have an s orbital. An s orbital is a sphere. As I increase the principal quantum number, not only does the orbital, the s orbital, get bigger, but it increases in energy. Now, for p orbitals, what you see here is they're showing you three different two p orbitals. Okay. You have a two p x, a two p y, and a two p Z, like that. Now, a question that would be a, a very good question, and I've been asked this question before, because here they show you the difference in size going from two to three and so forth. Okay. A student asked me one time, well, what if you had, so here's a 2p z orbital. What if I had a 3p z orbital? Would it be bigger? And the answer is absolutely. Okay. If you drew a 3p z, okay, it would be bigger. Now, again, that looks like crap, but this is a 3p z, right? And what if you had a 4p z? It would be even bigger. Okay. So the same thing applies for the p orbital. They just get bigger and bigger and bigger. Okay, it's easy. You can read my writing. Anyhow, okay. Uh, let's try another one here. Here are the d orbitals. Let's go over the names of them. You have a three d x squared minus y squared, the the uh, z squared, x y x z and y z. These three here I find pretty easy. To memorize, you know, because like, obviously I did a chemistry degree. I had to memorize them at one point in my life. Find those ones the easiest because they just uh, fit in between those lines in the graph. Like if it's x, y, it fits in between the x's and the y lines. The z squared also is kind of easy to remember just because it's the last letter of the alphabet squared and it's so wacky looking. And then you get the x squared minus y squared. Anyhow, those are the shapes of the, of the atomic orbital. All right. Well, it's six o'clock. Why don't we take a short break? And while we're taking that break, I'd like you to try this problem. If you, if you want to, you know, just genuinely take a break. You've earned it. You know, you listen to me talk for an hour. But this would be a good problem for you to take a look at. It says, list the values of N, L, and ML um, for orbitals in the 4D subshell. 